about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. I said to someone just recently, just in the last few days, that's our family. The kingdom of God is our family. That's our kingdom. That's our country. That's our nation. It's the kingdom of God. It's not the nation of the world. It's not the kingdom of Satan. It's the kingdom of God. And God has just been showing me some things, and I'm just going to share. So we'll start off by talking about, in Philippians, talking about a man who actually had every single reason to be totally in charge and secure about himself in the kingdom of the world. He was highly educated, he was advantaged, he was born into the right family, he had every credential that was needed to be the top dog. And this is what he says. He was actually faultless in legalism. He was very legalistic. And this is what he says. Whatever was to my profit, all the things that would be an advantage to me, whatever was to my profit, I now, now that he has seen the Lord Jesus, I now consider loss. Another translation says, I consider that actually a disadvantage now. Because now I'm battling my head, my education, my credentials, my everything, where the Lord is showing me a different kingdom, a different country, a different king, a different way of living. So all of that stuff now I actually consider a loss. It actually is a disadvantage now. But he doesn't just leave it there. He says, for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a disadvantage compared to the supreme value. The supreme value. Another way of say, saying it is the passing, the surpassing greatness of what? Of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. I consider them rubbish. Garbage. That I may gain Christ. So it's not that you throw out the garbage and you're left with nothing. We are gaining Christ. He is filling us up with treasure, not garbage. Okay. And to be found in Him. Not having a righteousness of my own. That's what was He had before. That comes from legalism. I say the right thing. I've preached this the other day. I say the right thing. I do the right thing. Let me have a th think today. I can't think of any big sinners today. I'm good. That's legalism. You know what? The Lord is showing us a different way. A way where we're living with a father in a household. Where we romp around like kids, just like the kids were running around the church before church this morning. That we are free. We are able to be ourselves. We can just run up to our dad anytime we like. And be like little children and keep learning and learning and just eating life. It's a different way. It's through faith in Christ. It's a righteousness that comes from God. It's Christ's faithfulness to us. And it's by trust. It's by trust. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection. And the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings. Becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. I'll just enlarge that a bit. Um, I was speaking with a friend recently, and we were talking about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I actually just looked it up so I got the words right. It's in Luke. And Jesus actually says they came along, and a whole big crowd of soldiers and stuff, because they wanted to get rid of him, right? And he's there with his disciples, and Peter cuts off. The one servant's ear. Jesus takes the ear and he says, excuse me, but I'm just going to put this ear back. Right? So he puts the ear back. And this is what Jesus says. Am I leading a rebellion that you've come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts. Every day, Jesus says, I was with you in the temple courts. I'm not leading a rebellion that you need to come at me with all this weaponry. We don't have to be cutting off ears here. And then he says this. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when they're about to arrest him, but this is your hour when darkness 
reigns. That's real. That we came out of the mouth of God. This is your hour when darkness reigns. But I'm standing here to tell you that the hour came and the hour went. All of the kingdom of darkness was rejoicing at that point in time, thinking, we've won. We've got him. We've conquered God. But that hour was about to pass. And it didn't stay like that. And Jesus did not justify himself. He went through what he had to go through. The hour passed. And now, every word that has been written through time about our God has come to pass. He has conquered death. He has conquered hell. He's conquered the kingdom of darkness. And we live in a different kingdom. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus Christ rules and reigns in a completely different dominion. So when we come across somebody who resists, understand this thing, people. Never stop proclaiming the good news. Because it's life and death. It's life and death. And we have life because Jesus dealt with the hour of darkness through his obedience. Praise be to God. I want to read you something from Jeremiah. It was long before this time that God was in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Jeremiah chapter 7, in verses 22 and 23, it says this. He was prophesying, and I'm prophesying today because this is just the word, right? And the word is the prophetic word from our Father. For when I brought your forefathers, okay, so that's not our generation. It's people that have known God and cried out to God and asked God to help them before, generations before. When I brought your forefathers out of Egypt, now we all know that, and when I spoke to them, so not just, oh, this is happening, God was literally communicating with his people at that time. I did not, listen to this carefully, it's a prophetic word for us, I did not just give them commands. Remember we talked about Paul, who was legalistic. He knew the commandments of God. He knew the, the written word of God. He knew the laws and the rules of God. And by that, he thought he knew God. But when he was confronted with Jesus, the actual person of Jesus, the actual person of God, and he said, Lord, who are you? It changed everything. He moved from knowing laws and commands into a living relationship with the living being, the living God of gods, King of kings. It was completely different. Now this is in Jeremiah. I did not just give them commands, but I gave them this command from the mouth of God. He says, hear with the voice of your heart, with the, with the, with the, with the, um, with the eyes and ears of your heart. But I gave them this command. Obey me. This is God speaking. And then it's like, oh, now from the world's point of view, we don't like that. But we're talking about a God who loves us. We'll come to that in a minute. And then God says, and I will be your God. And you will be my people. Walk. That's every day. Walk in all the ways I command you. Now we think, okay, that's a set of rules and set of laws. No, it's not. It is me, Heather, listening to God here now with me through the power of His Spirit in my circumstance. It's not the book of rules and commands. It's what the Spirit of God, what my Father is saying to me for my day today. That's a whole different thing. And He shares the treasure of what he's thinking, what he knows, the past and the future with us as we walk with him in obedience to him. Because you know why? Because we're just listening. And we're choosing to say, okay, Dad, I'm with you. Just like a good childhood. And it goes well with us. In fact, in the New Testament, one of the things that's said about children with parents is obey your parents. And there was a 
promise with that that it will go well with you. But we made an image of God. So when we obey God and what He is saying to us, because He loves us so intensely, it's going to go well with us. It says here, walk in all the ways I command you, that it may go well with you. That's what He actually says. That's moment by moment. But I don't want to leave it there because this is the dilemma prophesied by Jeremiah. But they did not listen or pay attention. Isn't this a picture of the world? That we've got the knowledge. There's knowledge about what's right and what's wrong and the rules and everything. But we've decided not to pay. I'm talking about the world now, not people that are walking with Jesus. We have decided not to pay attention or to listen. And this is what God actually says in this prophetic word. Instead, they followed. They followed means that was their mentor. That was the thing they decided on going with. Every moment of every day, this is what they went with. They followed the stubborn inclinations. That's what do I think about it today? What is my mood today? You know, what, what, what's going down today? What am I going to respond to this today? It's going to change all the time. But at the moment, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm following. The stubborn inclinations of their evil hearts. Now, the Lord has said He will give us a new heart when we come to Him. But that new heart is in connection with Him. It's beating with His life. Not our life. It's beating with the life of God. If we don't have a heart that's beating with the life of God, then we have a heart that is beating with the death of the devil. That's just the truth. I'm being very straight today because as I say, I was rocked this morning. And I'm going, you know what? I'm saying the same thing as this man here. I consider everything rubbish, garbage. I want to know God. This is life and death. And first of all, it's life in the church. And we need to be encouraged and built up and listen again and again to the prophetic word of the Lord so that we will be strong and we will know what the mind of God is so that we can determine and discern His perfect will as we walk with Him. So these are just notes, honestly, that I've been writing down as I've been spending time with God and every now and again I stop reading my Bible and I write something down so that I can get back to it. Listen to the prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ in Isaiah chapter 9. It's so cool. This is taken from a Jewish Bible that I actually, I'm reading, I read the NIV Bible. This is my Bible here. And then on my phone, I've got the Bible Hub. It's a little brown app. And every now and again, I just feel like reading another translation. And I've been really enjoying, um, I think, the complete Jewish Bible at the moment because it, it just shows you a different way of, of, of um, you know, what the words mean. So this is Isaiah chapter 9. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. Okay, we go, oh yeah, we know that's true. So thinking about it, I often am living in darkness. Before I knew Jesus Christ, I was living in darkness. Let me tell you what. And when the Lord shows himself to me, my goodness, that's just not any light. That is a great light. Think of darkness where you can't see anything and someone flips a light on. That is incredibly different. You can see so much you never could see before. It's like you've been made alive. Light is life. Okay. They've been living in darkness. They've seen a great light. Upon those living in the land that lies in the shadow of death, light has dawned. Thank you, my Jesus. I lived in the shadow of death. Of course I did. I know I did. Following the inclinations of my evil heart. Trying to work it out. But Jesus came supernaturally and he shined a light on my life. That was not from my own thinking people. It is his amazing grace in his love and his power. And that light made me see the truth. Yeah. A light has dawned. Dawning is just the beginning of the day. There's, there's better to come. Dawn is when you're just starting to see. There's more than that to come. Okay. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice in your presence. What is it that this light is bringing? Bringing the company, the presence, the inclinations of God, the thoughts of God, the presence of God Almighty. It's, it's that He is with us. His person is with us. We're not thinking it out, sorting it out on our own anymore. This is the thing. There's no work in this. There's no work in this. 
We don't have to do a thing. We rejoice in the presence of God. And this is how it is. I'll explain how it's going to work. Think about this thing. The Lord explains it this way. We rejoice in His presence as if it is rejoicing at harvest time. At harvest time we take. At harvest time the work has been done. There's no plowing happening. There's no planting happening. There's no watering happening. There's no praying that the, that the, that the drought will break or the rains will come. Nothing like that is happening. The rejoicing at harvest time is a time of celebration where it's done. That's how we rejoice in the presence of God. In that place, there's no work, there's no sweat, there's no following any more rules. There's just forgiveness and acceptance and dancing and joy and rest. Not only that, we rejoice in God's presence the way men rejoice when dividing up the spoil. Whoa. What happens when you're dividing up the spoil? That is a picture when they've been at battle. They've been in a war. And they've won the war. And all they do, going around now, is grabbing all the precious treasures off everybody. Off the enemy that are all lying around dead. Well, you know who's lying around dead? The kingdom of darkness. Jesus has conquered it. And all we do is we go around and we pick up the treasures that God is giving us and distributing to us free of charge we haven't had to fight that battle it's done that's how we rejoice in his presence there was a battle but we didn't fight the battle the battle is won we didn't win it but we are invited to come along and just grab the goodies oh please people can you see how this is just he is so worthy he's so worthy of us just every single day going, okay, God, I'm with you, no matter what's going down. Now, you, what you don't know is in the last few weeks, we've gone through a battle. I've walked very closely with Alana, mostly, my friend, who has seen the dark side of me many times as we're processing the battle, as we're processing what is going on. But let me tell you what, the Lord sticks with us, and He stays with us, and my husband would know this as well, and He sticks with us, and He stays with us, and he sticks with us and he stays with us. And then it starts to click. And you start to see what God has been saying to you. And you start to see there's a different way of seeing it. So when I spoke to my friend Robin this morning, she said, I didn't know you were going. I was able to tell her what I think now after the Lord in his presence and in his counsel has shown me what to think about it. He has shown me how to be and what to think. But it took a while. He's with us, people. He's with us. So we rejoice in His presence in this way. For the yoke that weighed me down, I'm saying, I'm going to make this personal now. It says them, but I'm going to say me. For the yoke that weighed me down was like, are you serious? The bar across my shoulders that was hurting my back and that I couldn't walk properly. And the driver's goad, the whip, that was going, there's no justice. There were so many times I wanted to go and do something about something and go and say something about something and the Lord just said, no, no, no. That's very hard for me. No, no, no. And it's like the driver's go is just whipping you and whipping you and whipping you. All right. This is what God says. You've broken. You've broken those things on the day of Midian's defeat as on the day of Midian's defeat. Now, oh, what's Midian's defeat? Do you know what that was? That was Gideon. When he was told, not the thousands of people, not the weaponry, take these vessels, break them, and the light's going to shine through. There's only going to be 300 of you, and you're going to have a bit of a shout and carry on, and then the whole army's going to be defeated. With nearly nobody, and no weapons, and no fighting, just a whole lot of hollering and running around and, and light. Wow! So this is what the Lord says, okay, Heather, I've broken that yoke off you, that bar across your shoulders, that whip. That goad, that goads you and goads you. Now, that's for me, but I'm telling you what, that's for you. Because God is a God that is no respecter of persons. And because we're in this building, I'm presuming that we're all his kids. We're all equally his kids, right? Because we've decided that we want Jesus as our Lord. And then it goes on and it says, For all the boots of soldiers marching, all right, so imagine, <laughs> all the soldiers marching together, all the boots on their faces, I'm sorry, on their faces, that is 
very weird to have boots on your face. Boots on their feet. And every cloak rolled in blood, talking about a battle, is destined for burning. No need. No need for the cloaks full of blood. No need for the marching of soldiers' boots. It's fuel for the fire. Why? Doesn't make sense. We know what the world's like. Come on, we've got to fight. We've got to stand up for our rights. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. No, 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 no. This is what the prophetic word says in Isaiah. No, guys, listen to me. For a child is born to us. A child is born to us. A son, capital S, is given to us. It's not going to be because we've earned it or anything. This is what God is doing. He's giving us a son. Dominion. That means authority, all right? That means rulership will rest, just rest on his shoulders. And he will be given the name, and I could say it very badly in Hebrew, but I won't. This is what it is. This is what God has done for us. This is the name of our God in our life, given to us as a gift. With the dominion on his shoulders. And this is what he has for us. He's called wonder of a counselor. Wonder of a counselor. He's called mighty God. He's called father of eternity. He is called prince of peace. That is who he is. You know why? says so. In order to extend, that means to make it bigger, the dominion, and perpetuate, that means to plant and grow and make it more, the peace of the throne and kingdom of David. What's the throne and kingdom of David? Oh, you mean that dude that completely lived by faith? That had a kingdom where God was in control of everything? That when he was sad, he cried to God. When he was happy, he rejoiced. He wrote all his songs and his psalms. And one minute he's a shepherd, the next minute he's a king. Gets kicked out, God restores him. He sins. He says, God, I've sinned against you. He has, he has to have consequences for that, but he never wavers. He never wavers. In his love, his trust, his reliance, and his faith in his God. That's our family. And God has said here, I'm going to give you myself <coughs> to enable this. So that this is going to be sustained, it's going to be secured, there's going to be a family on this earth, in this beautiful place that I've made, that is going to be my family. And we're going to do some stuff together. Like David, read about it. Go look at David, like that. That's our family. And it says this is how he's going to do it. He's going to do it through justice. And we go, okay, because we're not seeing a lot of justice, but God sees everything. And God's times and seasons will come to be. No matter what man, no matter what the kingdom of darkness thinks, thinks it's going to do, there will be an hour that looks like the darkness reigns, but the hour will always pass. Remember this into the future. That hour will always pass, and Jesus will rule and reign. And it says that he's going to do it with justice and righteousness. When? Henceforth, that's now, when this was written in Isaiah, that's a long time ago, and forever. That's today. That's my today. That's for me now. That's for you now. And then it goes, okay, how's it going to happen? And God says, I'm not going to leave you in the dark. This is how it's going to happen. The zeal, the zeal. Have you ever thought about zeal? Such passion. It's like, get out of my way, passion. It's just like, just make a way. Look at me, look at me. There's no option in this. Just move out the way kind of passion. That's zeal. That nothing will stop you. That kind of thing. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now, I wrote that down for me, but I'm sharing it with you today. See, Tom asked me to preach a couple of days ago, and I first of all said no, because I thought I'm not in a headspace, and I'm very aware that when you stand up and you speak for God... That, that's a serious business. I've always been very aware and have a holy fear of God in that thing. And I just said, no, Tom, I'm thinking to myself, I could not give that justice. Uh, it wouldn't be right. And then God got on my case. And he said 
said to me, what are you thinking? And, and when has this ever been about you? It's an honor and a, and a privilege. And if you ask to do something, then just do it. And I phoned Thomas back and he thought it was very funny. And he said, yeah, I knew you'd be stewing on this. <laughs> and I actually laughed and told, actually I told the which was very naughty of me. He said, yeah, he looked at the scriptures and then he went, ah, yeah, ah, yeah. And then I phoned and said, <laughs> I'll do it. And he was going, ah, yeah, because God's sorting it out. Because God will have his way. Yeah, Thomas is an amazing, brilliant preacher. But can you see what I'm saying here? Listen, when our life is in God, guys, we're invincible. And it doesn't matter what's going down in our circumstance. Whatever our anointing is, God will have his plans and purposes work through our lives. And that is it. And that is it. There's no exception to that. There's no gray shades of that. That's just how it is. Because the zeal of Almighty God will accomplish this. He will accomplish it and he uses his body. We are his body. Okay, I'm nearly finished. Seriously, I'm nearly finished. Uh, but you know, this is actually exciting. So, I pray in Ephesians 1 that Jesus will give light to the eyes of our hearts. Come on. Not the eyes that we see in a physical realm that is limited and worked out by our own understanding. That we will get that light that I've been talking about into the eyes of our hearts. So that we will live from the heart. And it was prayed in the prayer meeting this morning. I was so chuckled by that. It was prayed, God, that we would actually see in our hearts. That we would be touched in our hearts. And that we will understand the hope to which he's called us. We're not here as like orphans with nothing ahead, you know. We have got an amazing inheritance that is like heaven forever. We'll understand the rich glories. That's our inheritance. He's promised his people these things. And then we'll understand this in verse 19. How surpassingly great is his power working in us who trust him. His power is so great. Let's begin to understand this. The hour of darkness will pass. His power is the greatest. There is nothing that compares to him. In chapter 2 from Ephesians, it says, God is so rich in mercy and he loves us with such intense love that even when we were dead because of our acts of disobedience, he brought us to life along with Jesus, the Messiah. It is by grace that you Say, some translations say, delivered, I'm saying today. Delivered. Delivered from death, from hell, from my stubborn, rebellious heart. I've been delivered into incredible hope, amazing treasure. The wealth of the King of Kings, the creator of the, the, the universe. Now to him who by his power working in us is able to do, listen people, far beyond anything we can ask. Far beyond anything we can imagine. Because he's not limited to our asking or our imagination. <coughs> and he knows better. And he's got good plans. And sometimes they don't go according to our plan, but it's better. Yeah? To him be the glory. In the congregations of his people. You know when? From generation to generation to generation. From the ones that have gone before us to my children, to my grandchildren to my grandchildren's children until Jesus comes back. That's the word of the Lord. That is the word of my Lord. And the last thing I want to say to you, which I wrote it upside down on that day, for reasons I don't know, and this really, 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 really blessed me. Jeremiah chapter 33. This is so cool. This is very cool. Oh, Jeremiah was still confined in the courtyard of the God. So, when my husband no longer has a job, when Mari's husband is battling cancer, when the person that I met this morning is in, um, has a loved one that is dying, and all kinds of stuff is going on, this is what the Lord says. He who made, okay, when Jeremiah, let me go back. When Jeremiah was still confined in the courtyard of the God, he was not free in his circumstance. He couldn't just run around. Can you see what I'm getting at now? There's still stuff going down. All right. The word of the Lord came to him a second time. Do you know what God said to him? So help me. Please let it help you. Let the eyes of your heart be enlightened right now. This is what the Lord says. 
He who made the universe. Okay. The Lord who formed it and established it. This is what he said. He formed it and established the universe. This is what he says. The Lord is his name. This is all written down here. This is what he says. Just to know so we know who we're talking about here. Call to me. And I will answer you. And I will tell you great and unsearchable and hidden things that you do not know. I'll leave you with that. That's how life works. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I love him. He's my life. He's my deliverer. He's my future. He's seen everything. Praise God. Okay. Don't include other people. And don't overanalyze everything. Just walk like that sea person. You know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I believe the process to the Lord. I believe he's on the move. He's doing good things. There's a swelling up going. There's movement happening. And our job is just to have our trust in him alone. Amen. Be blessed. Have a wonderful day. Now.